Hi everyone and welcome back to the first few hours of Civilization 6. So, let's continue where we left off. We pissed out with Monty for a bit to take care of some of these Chinese units and I wanted to test a few things with diplomacy. By the way, if you have any questions about Civ 6, feel free to post them below in the comment section and I'll do my best to answer if I'm able to. Just remember that I obviously don't have all the answers. There are a lot of things that I don't know about the game and there are a lot of things that I wish I had time to test. But there are definitely questions I can answer that I might not cover in these videos. Unfortunately, China is just too far away, so I won't really be able to attack China. I would have considered it if they were closer. I'm just going to get rid of all the units that they are sending. It's a little bit weird that they only sent warriors. Maybe they didn't have better techs yet? I'm not sure. I mean, this is only turn 61. So perhaps they just didn't have a lot of better units, who knows. We'll kill them. Always some extra experience. Now, I don't think I've had... And here you can see that the warrior upgrades to a swordsman, just like in Civ 5. But unfortunately, I can't do it just yet, because I don't have iron. I will start a fourth city to the south, to get that iron on the coast. But that's just one, so it's only enough for one single unit. Still, one of my goals here was to recruit as many different units as possible, which is why I'm trying to get the resources for the upgrades. We are also about to get Mathematics, which unlocks everyone's favorite Civ 5 wonder, the Petra. It's still just as good in Civ 6, it still adds yields to desert tiles. And it does require floodplains to build. And I'll actually be able to research Stirrups next, which unlocks the Knights. And I already have the Eureka boost for that, because we got it from the Great Scientist. My plan at this point was to get some stronger units and then declare war on Monty again. And the knight is the first medieval era unit that I can unlock here. So that would give us an edge against Monty. Meanwhile, we still need to kill all these Chinese warriors. Hey, it's always nice for experience, right? All the unit movement is going to take a while though. We are around halfway through this game in terms of number of turns, at least from what I remember, it ends at turn 100 something. But in terms of actual time left, yeah, there is still quite a lot, mostly because the turns will be slower. There are a lot of units to move around. So let's talk about some other topics. I saw some comments and discussions about playing tall versus playing wide in Civ 6. And one thing I didn't mention just yet is that there is actually a penalty, which is supposed to prevent various forms of ICS strategies, which stands for Infinite City Sprawl, in case you're not aware. And you might have noticed what I'm talking about, actually, when I was recruiting a settler. The cost for recruiting settlers, the production cost of a settler, goes up each time you recruit a settler. And it actually goes up quite significantly, or at least that was the case in the build I played. I don't know if it's going to be final. My first settler on quick speed costed 67 hammers, and my fourth settler would cost 134. So the cost for the fourth settler doubled compared to the first. Again, these numbers might not be final, who knows? But that is a significant increase. So that's one of the things that's supposed to prevent extreme forms of ICS. And the second one is a similar penalty to districts. It's not as harsh. I think it increased by like few percent when I built a district. But considering you need multiple districts in every city, it will add up over time, that's for sure. But that doesn't mean you can't play wide, you absolutely can. Not only that, there are buildings and mechanics that clearly benefit wide playstyle, like for example, one of the buildings later on can spread its bonuses to other cities with a certain range. So that clearly benefits a wide playstyle with tightly packed cities. 
On the other hand, there are also mechanics that benefit tall empires. So I think both styles will be viable. It's just that what I think developers want to achieve here is limit extreme forms of both. So they don't want extremely tall or extremely wide empire to become the most optimal strategy. Which I definitely like and I hope the game will achieve that because I personally was never a fan of ICS. I really disliked that strategy back in Vanilla, Civ 5 and then Gods and Kings. But I also don't really think it should be possible to have a super powerful empire with like two or three cities only. So I'm all for limiting extreme forms of both. And I do hope Civ 6 will manage to achieve that. And it doesn't mean you can't do it, because obviously if you really want to, you can still play with free cities or whatever, or you can try to make ICS work. It just shouldn't be the clearly optimal strategy that's so much better than anything else. By the way, I don't know if you noticed Laventa unique bonus just a minute ago at around 5 minutes 10 seconds mark. It allowed your builders to make colossal health improvements. I actually really wish I had the time to check out some of these unique city state bonuses and actually test them in practice because some of them are really damn interesting. A unique city state bonus that actually allows you to build a tile improvement that you otherwise wouldn't be able to build. That's way more interesting than anything city states in Civ 5 ever did. And I have a feeling some city states will be really hotly contested. Because remember, anyone can get the regular bonus from city states in Civ 6, but the unique bonus can only go to the Civ with the most envoys in that city state. It's definitely one of the parts of Civ 6 that made me really curious after playing this. Still working on kicking out China. Also, we are going to need way more gold soon. I was actually way short on gold to upgrade all the units that I needed to upgrade. And I'm making 27 gold per turn. Which is pretty decent considering this is only turn 67. This is still pretty early into the game. But unit upgrades can get pretty expensive. I also needed the strategic resources, but not all units require those. Take crossbowmen. I wasn't able to upgrade all my archers to crossbowmen because I just didn't have enough gold. But we will go to war with Monty, don't worry about that. And I will actually show you some of the diplomatic penalties for surprise wars slightly later into the game. Because early on, declaring a surprise war isn't really a big deal. It's almost supposed to be the natural state at the start of the game. But as you progress through the game, the penalties for surprise wars get progressively harsher. And in the mid game, the penalty is actually pretty damn harsh. You can quite easily get everyone to hate you. If you just declare surprise wars left and right and don't care. Everyone will hate you very quickly too. But you will get to see that a little bit later. Still working on kicking out China. And I should be getting the first tonight sometime soon. I don't remember the exact cost for that upgrade, but it was expensive. I kind of wish the turns were a little bit faster, <laughs> because I didn't get that far into the game considering I had several hours. But yeah, it's still almost three months until release, so it's to be expected in a build this early. And we got recorded history. That actually unlocks a pretty nice policy, the natural philosophy, which increases your campus adjacency bonus. I won't be picking it up just yet, but it's a really nice policy for a science boost. Especially if you have campuses with a lot of bonuses. Here I'm checking out the next civic options. There are some interesting ones in here, and I will go for the military bonus from feudalism. It will take a while to research feudalism, but I didn't have any boss for any of these things. And I could actually try to build six farms. I don't think I'll have the time for it. But six farms are not that hard to build. 
and here you can see that I'm at minus two amenities in Rio, and you can see the penalties for that. It affects citizen growth and non-food yields. And I'm currently at two out of four. And these penalties add up. This is basically how happiness works in Civ 6. And you could see all the factors that affect amenities right there. So I had plus two from luxuries, but there are potential penalties from war wariness. That was interesting. In more exciting news, we got a great general, and maybe you noticed that one of the special abilities for this particular great general was converting adjacent barbarian units, which isn't something I really made use of in this game, unfortunately. I probably should have tried. But it's a really strong ability, and that was on top of providing a combat bonus. However, the combat bonus only works for classical and medieval units, so it will not work for the entire game. You will actually need new great generals if you want to maintain that bonus. I actually kind of like that. You can't just get one great general at the start of the game and then use him throughout the entire game, all the way to modern or information era. Also, you could see me starting city walls in Rio just a moment ago. I already mentioned this before, but without city walls, your city cannot actually bombard enemy units. But with city walls, you can attack not only with the actual city center, but also with the encampment. Which makes encampment placement really damn important for defensive purposes. But you seriously need city walls. If you don't get city walls and some basic defenses early in the game, that's just an invitation for your neighbor to conquer you. On the other hand, it's things like this that really make me wonder whether the AI will be able to recognize the tactical benefit of good encampment placement. Because there will be huge benefit to good encampment placement. Choke points in Civ 6 will likely be even harder to take than in Civ 5. I could definitely see that being the case. Especially with a well-placed encampment. Which really makes me wonder whether the AI will be able to make use of that. Properly. I guess we'll see. Only one way to find out. And here we got our last settler, and I'm actually going to grab that iron to the southwest and get a coastal city, because that's going to be my first coastal city. And here's another new mechanic. In Civ 6, you can actually attach some units to each other, and in this case, I can attach my general to a unit and create an escort formation, which means your general is guaranteed to have protection at all times. It would be better to use an actual melee unit for this, the strongest melee unit you have, but I mostly did it to just show how exactly the mechanic works. You know, the one thing that I actually kind of hope the game will have eventually, either as an actual feature or maybe through mods, a continent map mode. <laughs> because the game could really use that, especially on maps like this. Monty is on a separate continent, for example. His continent is actually Australia. <laughs> and I'm on my own continent. I already discovered like five different continents at this point. I think you will see it for a brief moment here. Yeah, see? That's Australia. That's his continent, and mine is Atlantica. So I actually kind of wish there was some kind of continent map mode, just to be able to tell where does each continent start exactly. Maybe it will be a thing eventually, we'll see. If it's not an official feature, I'm sure someone will make a mod sooner or later. And it's kind of needed, for sure. In other news, we're about to kick China out. Which means I will be able to focus on Monty again sometime soon. But I still need a lot more gold than I have right now. 256 is not a whole lot. I think that's only enough for like one night upgrade. I don't remember the exact cost for a night upgrade. And when you look at all these upgrade costs here, remember that this is all quick speed. That actually applies to pretty much everything in this game. If you compare anything that you can see here to Civilization V, so things ranging from research times, from production costs, to unit upgrades times, do not compare it to Civilization V played on standard speed, because that's what most people play on. Compare it to Civilization V on quick speed, because that's what this game is, it's quick speed. 
Oh, and another small thing that I kind of really like is that you can clearly see which units have how many promotions. It's a small thing, but it definitely helps. I'm actually kind of curious what some of the more advanced unit promotions are. I wasn't able to check those in this game, mostly because it was too short. But that's fine, it just means I'm really looking forward to playing it more. <laughs> a lot more. So far, I have to say, the game mechanics behind Civ 6 are really solid. There are some minor concerns that I have, like, for example, how well the AI will be able to use them. But other than that, Civilization 6 is looking really damn good so far. I'm really looking forward to playing it a lot more. Still heading in the general direction of our fourth city. That's going to be the last city in this game, unfortunately. Well, the last city I actually settled myself, let's just say. Because I might or might not be capturing one, if you know what I mean. But it's going to be the first coastal city. So that will give me a chance to build a harbor district, from what I remember. Also, I'm not sure if you noticed the timing on engineering. I started researching engineering while also working on the Eureka Boost. There's the Eureka Boost, and it brought the research time down to one turn only, so that's nice. There are actually quite a lot of small decisions like this that you have to make all the time. It's just not as obvious when you watch me play, especially with post commentary, so that I can't tell you what exactly I was doing at the time and what my thought process was. And actually, that's one of the reasons why I'm excited about Civilization VI, because there are so many different things to optimize, and while it's always interesting to see what kinds of ideas other people come up with, the way I like to play is coming up with my own strategies, not just go look up whatever optimal strategies other people came up with. I like to develop these strategies over time myself and experiment with things. That's the reason I play strategy games after all, <laughs> you know. Anyway, back to what's actually happening. You can probably see that we're getting more gossip now, and we'll actually have even more with America. Which I'm about to check. Yeah, we have four different items in the last ten turns. And some of them are actually fairly specific, like the fact they used a heavy chariot to clear a barbarian camp. That's awfully specific. I'm curious to see just how specific this gossip will get in the future because you're supposed to get more detailed information over time. And you can actually do things that give you more gossip with various sieves, like send a trade route. And here we're going to build a street carnival, because we are at minus three amenities in Rio, so it definitely needs some help there. Also, notice how we are at 9 out of 13 housing capacity, so housing hasn't been a problem just yet in any of my cities. Housing feels like more of a mid-game and late-game thing. It definitely becomes more important in mid-game and late-game. And food becomes slightly less important than housing. And we should be starting our new city sometime soon. But still need a few more turns to actually get there in the first place. That will be the last one in this game. The AI is still trying so hard to buy my grid work, but nope. I'm actually starting to think that maybe it was a bug that we got it from a hut. I don't think that's supposed to happen, but who knows, there's no real way to tell. But it might have been a bug that it actually spawned there. Sorry Cleopatra, you can't have it. We are about to finish engineering. Which means we can build a catapult or two. That was pretty much my plan before attacking Monty, because again, my plan is to go for Tenochtitlan, and he will actually attack the city-state, because he's bored apparently. So that's good for me in a way, because his units will be slightly out of position, but we still need quite a lot of upgrades, and at least wait for one catapult perhaps. And I still need an upgrade to a knight. I should be getting it sometime soon. 
my chariot was a little bit busy. Definitely need a stronger army though, because this is not enough units to take a city, especially a well defended one. And we got yet another Eureka boost, always nice. By the way, a lot of these Eureka boosts I don't just get by accident. I was actually looking at the tech tree to see what the Eureka boosts are, and I planned around them specifically. Some of them I even timed, like the engineering one. I did get a few on the way while doing normal things that you do in game, but a lot of them were planned in advance. You know, if I got that great general a little bit earlier than I did, he would have been so much more useful, <laughs> because I mostly killed all the barbarians in the area already. It might be a valid strategy to just leave the barbarian camp up if you are actually going for that specific great general, because then you can just convert the barbarians. It will definitely be a valid strategy, as long as it's a barbarian camp that's far enough from the AI or maybe hidden behind your territory so that the AI will not destroy it instead. Anyway, that's going to be the end of this episode. I'm going to continue in the next one, so thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.